president of the Fredericksburg branch of the NAACP. We welcome you this morning. By being in attendance, you support our mission. And our mission is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all people. And to eliminate race-based discrimination. By being in attendance today, you also honor Dr. King's legacy. You hopefully will rededicate yourselves to continue his work. If he were living here in Fredericksburg today, to name a few things, he would be working to raise the minimum wage. He would be working to ensure that the history of our ancestors here in Fredericksburg would be told by more than a slave auction block. He would be working to find affordable housing for low-income families. He would be working to end this ridiculous government shutdown. There is work to be done. Shortly, this breakfast will feed our bodies. Shortly, our speaker will feed our minds. But right now, I want us to feed our spirits. Just as Dr. King's spirit was fed many years ago, his fight for freedom was sustained by protest songs. And when we say we shall overcome, we don't want to drag it out. We want to say we shall overcome. And we want to say deep in my heart, I do believe. But we're not going to sing that song this morning. <laughs> We're going to talk about waking up, because most of us had to wake up early this morning, yeah. early this morning. I'm going to lead you in a song that we sang when we were picketing in downtown Fredericksburg. When we were sitting in downtown Fredericksburg, we had to wake up with our minds set on freedom. Now, the old folks say stayed on freedom. But I'm going to sing it like we sang it, and we sang Set on Freedom. So I want y'all to please, please, please sing along with me. Sing like Dr. King's spirit is in the room with us. Sing like you woke up with your mind on freedom. And it goes like this, and join in, please. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Hallelujah! 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 You know we walk in and talk in with the mind. I woke up this morning with 
Let us bow to pray. Eternal and loving God, our Father, we gather this morning, first of all, to give honor, glory, and praise to your holy and righteous name, and to thank you for being such a great, mighty, marvelous, and good God. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that is ours to see another God-given day. Father, we invoke your presence here with us this morning as we commemorate the 20th century icon, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who is truly a great man of God with a great mission, with a great concern for all peoples. But certainly, he was a predominant leader in the civil rights movement for equal rights for all people in America. God, we say thank you. We thank you, God, how you used him to help, oh God, pass the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act. And yet, even today, as we sit here, we're ever mindful of the suppression of the voting rights for our people. God, there is much work you've already heard said to be done. And God, as we think of that great historic speech, I have a dream. God, it certainly intensified the civil rights movement. But God, as we sit here today, we're ever mindful that there is much work to be done. God, we can never forget all that he did for the cause of African Americans, but for the cause of all peoples, that there would be equality and justice for all. And yet we're sitting in front and preparing for a hearty and a healthy breakfast. And yet we have a government shutdown where there are those who don't know how they'll pay for fuel or food. They don't know how they'll pay for medicine or the mortgage bill. But yet, God, your word tells us to cast our cares upon you for you care for us. And Heavenly Father, we're ever mindful 
that all you can hear about is a wall being built, a wall, God, to keep immigrants out and to continue to racially divide. But God, I'm mindful today that the Reader's Digest cover was right. Fantastic facts, but they are false. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us to know that yes, we might need a wall, but let us build the right kind of walls. These folks are trying to come across for humanitarian reasons, I believe, just to have a better way of life. Help us, oh God, to keep that dream alive by being advocates for social justice, political justice, education, and the rights of all people. Heavenly Father, I pray today that we will certainly build walls, but build walls, oh God, that will tear political ignorance and racial deprivation. Let us build walls of democracy and decency. Let us build walls, oh God, that will give entitlement and ownership to the personhood of human dignity. Let us build spiritual walls, God, that will unite us and make us one in you. Walls of love and peace and justice and harmony. Walls of God that we might know that we are one in you. And when we can become one, God, then we can love one another as God has loved us. Help us not to be fearless to stand up and speak up as Dr. King did for what is right. For your word tells us you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. Help us, Heavenly Father, I pray to respect the rights of others, and to love everybody, to continue to put our trust and faith in you, and help us, oh God, to have a prayer life by which we can look to the hills from which come with our help, for our help comes from you who made heaven and earth. Make us advocates, we do pray for the cause of human rights. Bless our president of this grand sister, Charlene Jackson Fields, Bless every officer, every member. Bless every branch and even the national body. And I pray, God, this prayer in the name of the one who was, who is, and shall be forevermore. In the name of Jesus. And those who love the Lord say amen. 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 amen.
that better? Yeah. Come on and give this group another round of applause. It is an all happy place. Just a few housekeeping notes before we continue on. We're going to ask Brother Armstead, uh, could we move this speaker back a little? The people on that side can't see the stage or anyone standing at the podium. I don't know who's in charge of this. Thank you so much. Um, housekeeping note number two. The little ornament that's on the table of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is not a souvenir. <laughs> I'm the messenger. <laughs> Housekeeping note number three. When it's time to eat, the room will be divided and there will be host and host. of celebratory celebration. I say to you today, my friends, that in spite of the difficulties and frustrations of the moment, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hill of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a desert state sweltering with the heat of injustices and oppressions, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. My tribute to the great prophet, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. At this time, I'm going to ask Robert Barnett to come. Would you give him a hand as he comes? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Robert Garner. I'm the Vice President of the Virginia State Conference. First of all, give an honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to be here. As my mentors and senior mentors used to say, it's good to be seen and not be viewed. <laughs> I feel at home this morning because of the spirit that's in this place. I bring you greetings from our president, Reverend Kevin Chandler, and the Virginia State Conference in AACP. As many of you know that this used to be our lobby day, but this administration changed lobby day from this day till tomorrow, the Tuesday after MLK Celebration Day. And so we would like, if you so desire, to help us because the General Assembly is in session. And we all should, number one, hold on to our pocketbooks. <laughs> number two, advocate for the civil rights of those who are less fortunate than we are. And so, if you so desire to come to Richmond tomorrow and help us in our annual uh, lobby day. Last but not least, we want to thank the Fredericksburg chapter of the NAACP annual president for the tremendous advocacy you have done in this area. We have seen the results we have been uh, looking for and through the direction of the president, Charlene Jackson Field, you have made great strides. 
and we thank you. I'd like to end on one note that I think uh, deserves some bit of uh, enumeration for Dr. King. He said, the time is always right to do good. And that's what I want to leave with you. The time is always right to do good. And let's do good in our community. Thank you so much. Receive Congressman Bob Whitman at this time. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. good morning. good morning. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. What a blessing and honor to be here with you this morning to, to celebrate today. Dr. Martin Luther King. And, and I want to share a tweet this morning from his daughter, Dr. Bernice King, in describing Dr. Martin Luther King, who, who, who I believe is truly uh, an inspiration for all of us. But her words, I think, capture exactly who Dr. King was and is today and continues to be. And she said, Dr. King was a Christ-centered, love-fueled, justice-seeking, peacemaking, globally minded, nonviolent revolutionary, and prophet. And indeed, that's exactly what we celebrate today, is that legacy. And folks, you know, we can, we can look all around us and see things that divide us, but Dr. King wasn't about that. Dr. King was about what unites us. Dr. King was about bringing us together. Dr. King was about that vision where he knew that equality and justice was brought about by those things innate in all of us as human beings, and that is love. Amen. The love that we have for each other, the love that permeates those differences that we have. And he said this, he said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. And today, sometimes when we look at divisions, it's easy to look at the differences. It's more difficult to look at what we have in common. And just what we see up in Washington today is an example of where differences are highlighted, but indeed we should be looking at what we have in common because I do believe there is more common ground than any of us can even dream. And when we seek to solve this nation's problems, it is that common ground that we should be finding and where we should be putting our effort, not the effort in looking at what the differences are. And the effort should be placed in that common element of love for each other in order to get things done. And I know sometimes that's hard in today's social media presence where everything is highlighted and divisions tend to be what makes the headlines, but that is indeed not what is in all of us to get done. Dr. King said this, he said, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And I couldn't agree with him more. Today, that element of love, that common ground, the things that all of us have together that we can use as an energy to get things done is what we need to emphasize. Today is a reminder. Dr. Martin Luther King is a reminder of what brings us together. The reminder of the energy that he brought to solve the problems around us. Even those problems that seem insurmountable, where differences seem too great. Dr. King persevered. Dr. King inspired us to say, no, there is no difference too great. There is no challenge too great. There is an opportunity for us to get things done. Today ought to be the example set not just here in Fredericksburg and the leadership here in the Fredericksburg chapter of the NAACP, but what permeates throughout Virginia and what should permeate throughout this nation 
and the energy to be able to get things done. And that's driven by what we have in common, but it's also driven, too, by our faith, by our faith in God, and also the faith in the power of prayer. And I'd like to close with this because I think it's foundational to who we are as a people and as a nation. Where Christ tells us in the words of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, who are gathered in my name, shall humble themselves, seek my face, pray, and turn from their wicked ways, and I shall from heaven hear their prayers and heal their land. May God bless each of you. May God bless our great Commonwealth of Virginia. And may God bless our United States of America. Minister Armstead continues to give us just a little music. At this time, we're going to prepare ourselves for a blessing. On top of a blessing, we have two students, Mejia Abel, a student at the University of Mary Washington, accompanied with his friend, Alexander Abel, his brother, a student from George Mason University. And they have a treat for us. Design is the blessing of this people. Another hand. We are now prepared and ready for breakfast. So as um, the those in charge, thank you. Enjoy your meal. Um, at this time, we're going to uh, prepare ourselves for another musical selection by Keith Armstead, Minister Armstead in its ensemble. And this begins the second portion of our program. So please, ma'am, please, sir, continue to, to fellowship at a um, lower volume so that you can enjoy what's happening here also. Walk right on by, yes, ma'am. <laughs> And while the group is steadily coming, so I won't have to just come right back, right after the musical selection by Minister Armstead and the ensemble, 
There will be a tribute by Xavier Richardson, whom we all know and love, one of our dear brothers, co-laborers of this uh, great organization, the NAACP. He's the president of Mary Washington Healthcare Foundation. He will come and do a, a um, tribute. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Everywhere, 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 everywhere
each year is our desire to recognize persons in our community who are great humanitarians who represent well the ideals and principles of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present the first award to Mr. and Mrs. Johnny P. Johnson. And Johnny and Jean came to Fredericksburg over 60 years ago, separately. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know one another. They both came to teach at the then segregated Walker Grant School. Johnny, an artist with great taste, quickly zoomed in on Jean. <laughs> I must say, Johnny was a prime candidate and was uh, certainly, I uh, had a lot of other women looking at him, single women, but Jean went up. And we're so glad that they both came here to Fredericksburg. And Johnny will say that it was not in his plans to come here because he, uh, who is, he's a phenomenal athlete and he's in the uh, Hall of Fame at Virginia State University for basketball. And certainly, Fredericksburg has been blessed mightily through their, both of their presence here. They have consistently given of themselves selflessly to make sure that this community is a better place. Um, through their reputation, both as outstanding educators, community advocates, philanthropists, and church leaders. So we recognize them for their contributions in the field of education, excellence in education. Uh, they both taught in the Fredericksburg City Schools, and Johnny also, I think, has taught at every type of school possible in this area. He taught at Germana, he was the first African-American teacher at, uh, at the University of Mary Washington. And he was also the State Teacher of the Year, which meant he was the best teacher all right. in all of the Commonwealth of Virginia. The thing about both of them is that they wanted to make sure that every child had the opportunity to develop to their fullest potential. They did not look at the backgrounds of students to determine the fate of them, but instead they knew that every child could learn and they suited their learning, their teaching, to ensure that they all excelled. I couldn't draw. I started off with a C in the class, and by the end of the year I had a C plus. <laughs> We also thank them for their dedication to community service. They have given so freely to so many different organizations, including their respective Greek letter organizations, Omega Sign Phi Fraternity and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. They have also been great family persons, raising two wonderful sons who are very much like both of them. One is like one and one like the other. You figure it out. But we appreciate that they have given so freely that they believe in to whom much is given, much is required. And lastly, we thank you for the philanthropic support. How many of you have been to any community, to community events here in Fredericksburg where you've seen Johnny Johnson donated paintings as part of the major fundraiser? The reason I'm talking about it. I've been to auctioneer office, so when you start raising your hand, I was going to say, what's your bid, sir? So <laughs> Serving many organizations with pride because of it, including the Black Arts Festival, uh, which could not uh, have continued to exist for many years without their unselfish generosity. So today, in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, we'd like to present 
to them this award, and there's a gift that will come with it too, Mr. Johnson. So we are we're struggling with what do you give the person who has everything? And typically, what is it? A Johnny Johnson painting. Well, it doesn't work for that. But there will be a gift for coming as well. So we're going to thank you and congratulate you um, for all your so many kind acts, and most of all, for being a superior mentor to so many of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Years ago, over 60, about 65 years ago, I was at home in Henderson, North Carolina. And for those of you who probably know some of the expressions of people who have mental illnesses, there was a gentleman who did have a mental illness, and he was acting up, I guess literally, on evening. And his sister called, and they both were fully grown, I guess. One, he was in his 40s or 50s, and his sister was probably in about the same age in that area. And they called the police on him, and the police came, and they couldn't get him out of the house. They'd run everybody out of the house. And they began to throw tear gas in the house. So in spite of his deficiency of the mental illness, he was smart enough to get wet towels and so forth, and so he maintained. Now, Henderson, was kind of like a hotbed, too, for the KKK. Mm -hmm. So when the sheriff came down, there was a taxi driver, well known in Henderson, who came and was observing the police trying to get the man out. And so the sheriff deputized this cab driver <coughs> who had a 30-30 rifle in the back of his car, took the rifle out and was legal then, and shot the man killed. Mm. Shortly after that, Reverend McKnight, who was in the NAACP, started working with young people, helping them to be involved. And it had an impact on me. So, when I came to Fredericksburg, who do you run into? A noted civil rights person, actress, Mamie Scott. Well, I got involved in the Council on Human Relations, and in spite of the fact that we had 10 people from Mary Washington College working in the Human Relations, the dean of the college, was a member of the Human Relations, but we could not have an integrated meeting at Mary Washington College. The first time the NAACP applied to have a meeting at Mary Washington, it was rejected. The next time, at that time, Reverend Davies was on the city council and the head of the NAACP came here to more or less monitor things as they were, we were trying to get a place to stay, uh, to have the uh, state meeting. And they said, well, if we can't have it at Mary Washington, we'll have it at Maury. Well, they want to reject that. Well, the officer from the NAACP said, well, Asked Reverend Davies, who had no, no old sight then, asked Reverend Davies, why don't you go back and tell them, if we can't have it at Maury, we'll have it outside of the state office, I mean, the local office here. And Reverend <coughs> Davies evidently did that, and so they yielded and we had it. But I was involved in the NAACP always since Reverend McKnight fought the 
County about the killing of a black man because he was not armed, but he had me interested and other young people interested in civil rights. And that has been something I've been concerned about since, since a fair play for all of us, all citizens. And so I thank Mamie Scott who said, you and Johnny are gonna have to become a life member of the NAACP. <laughs> and I said, you know, back then, you know, didn't have a whole lot of money. Don't have it now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but she stayed on me. And Mamie and John and Dr. White, Philip White, some of you are old enough, you may not admit it, <laughs> remember Dr. White and how hard he had worked toward civil rights. And I thank you because that made a, made a whole lot of sense to me. And I was around people, Reverend Davies, Dr. White, and Mr. Todd, who was on the school board. And the only reason that we, the NAACP didn't find the school board is because Mr. Todd was a member. <laughs> but each member of the school board could have been fined for their lack of response positively toward school integration and so forth. But anyway, Fredericksburg has been good to me. Jean has been right there with me. <laughs> with a whole lot. <laughs> but she has worked very hard toward doing some of the same things that I have been doing and very much because she's been more or less behind the scenes. But I think a lot of people, a lot of good people who do a whole lot don't necessarily get recognized because of what happened. I'm an artist and I show and people give me perhaps a little bit more credit than I'm due. But I ask God to help me to not let ego get in the way and keep on doing what Mama said. Everybody is somebody. And that is something that I truly believe. I guess and until I die, I will try to respond in that way. Thank you, Mr. Lee Johnson, for all that you've done for Freddie Spurs. It's always good to hear one's story because it helps you to understand their perspective and what really drives them. And Mr. Johnson, we say to you and Mrs. Johnson that typically people will say behind every great man, there's a great woman. That's our scripture base, isn't it, preachers? Because woman was not created from the backbone of man who walked behind man nor from the head bone to walk above, nor from the foot bone to walk below. But it said it was created from the side, from the rib. And Mr. Johnson, I say to you, what you have here is not a fair rib, but a prime rib. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Brandon, can you come and help me for the next presentation? Uh, we talked about perspective and person's backgrounds and how it drives and propels them to do things, and we heard about Mr. Johnson. At this time, we want to recognize a young person whose past has driven him to do many great things in the community, Mr. Brandon Wolders. Amen. Brandon really has a beautiful smile, but he's shocked because he knew nothing about this. And so one person in the room, 350 people said, congratulations to you. He came back and said, for what? Brandon, you are the first recipient of the Humanitarian Award for Young People. about Brandon. I first really got to see his, his humanitarian side when we were at the National Black Theater Festival 
in Winston-Salem. I had a bus load of kids that I was responsible for. And one young man had to go to the bathroom. We couldn't find him. And I said, well, you all go ahead, go ahead, and I'll bring, bring up the rear. And Brandon said, no, I'll stay here with you. That was the first time. So when the young man came along, we started walking back. And then I was engrossed in conversation. Then I turned around, and there was no Brandon. I said, my God, your mom's going to kill me if I lose this child. So then I looked and looked, and then he came up on me. I said, Brandon, where have you been? He said, oh, I was giving some money to that homeless person back there. He did it without any fanfare. If I hadn't asked the question, I would not have known. He wasn't doing it because everybody else was around him. But he did it out of his heart. And I said, Brandon, what makes you do that? And when he told me what made him do this, it reminded me of this story when Mary and Joseph had gone to Jerusalem to the feast of Passover and had Jesus with them. He was 12 years old. And when they left, they went on ahead and they assumed that he was behind them. And they, a couple of days later, they couldn't find him. And so they went back to Jerusalem and they looked and they looked and they looked and they, looked and they found him. And they told him, they said, what are you doing? Where have you been? And that's what he said. I, I have to go about my father's business. Because Brandon told me the reason why he did this is because his late father would always have them stop. When they were at the track light and they saw someone who was in need, asking for money to get out and give them money. Brandon's father passed up a long illness, which I know had a traumatic experience was a traumatic experience to him. And many young people go through that and they long for their fathers. And certainly I know he longed for his father, but he decided that he would honor his father by living his father's legacy, of continuing to do these things, not because his father is there watching, but he knows his father's looking down on him. And he does random acts of kindness all the time that other people aren't aware of. I also saw when Brandon, who was one of the most popular scholar athletes at James Earl High School, and his team captain of the football team, and very popular. He had won a lot of those um, things that I never won, Marcy Hill. You <laughs> <laughs> haven't had good luck in popular. I didn't get mine today, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but for the prom, where he was going to be uh, one of these uh, upper prom prince as a junior, and ultimately he didn't win. Brandon took two girls to the prom. Not because he thought he was that much of a player, but instead, he wanted to make sure that a young lady who otherwise would not have the opportunity to go was asked, and she was a special needs kid, who otherwise would not go to the prom. And he gave her, gave her He asked her in the same fanfare that all of the students asked their girlfriends and other special uh, 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 guests. And he had a, uh, a poster and gave her flowers and was videotaping around the field in front of all her friends. Because that's Brandon. Then he came Valentine's Day. Now I know most of the guys in high school, that's when they drop the girlfriends so they don't have to buy it. <laughs> well, Brandon. Brandon said to me, you know, there are a lot of female custodians here who I think don't have a special man in their respective lives. I want to do something special for them. I want to give them candy. I want to give them the flowers. And he went and he gave 12 women of the custodial staff flowers and candy for Valentine's Day last year. This is just one of the many, many random acts of kindness that uh, representative of his uh, principles and those with Dr. King. And I say to you, Brandon, I'm very proud of you. I appreciate what you've done. And I think that he's helped to create an atmosphere that now, even at James and Rose, last spring, when, when it was time for the prom queen contestants to, and persons to be voted, there was a, a mass um, attempt and successful attempt to make sure that a special needs student was the prom queen at James and Rose High School. So Brandon, through an anonymous donation from someone, we have a check for you for $250 for you to spend in any way that's appropriate in the eyes of your mother. Here you are. Thank you. I'm proud of you.
way. You get the new attitude. That's what we need, new attitudes. Am I right about it? Yeah. Beautiful. At this time, we will prepare ourselves with another selection by Keith Armstead and his ensemble. And following that, we're going to have the introduction of the keynote speaker by Caitlin Bennett, uh, the chair of Fredericksburg Democratic Committee. And uh, then we will have the keynote speaker, the Reverend Joshua Cole, president of the Stafford County branch of NAACP, and many, many, many more things to come. Come on, sing. Good morning. Good morning. It is my honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Reverend Joshua Cole. I was fortunate to meet Joshua back in 2017 at the beginning of his run in the House of Delegates. I quickly recognized that Joshua has a certain charisma, that sparkle in his eye, that convinced me that he was driven and he has a vision and that he would go far. That is why. It was so exciting that he became the youngest and the first African American to be nominated by a political party for the House of Delegates in Virginia's 28th District. Now, I don't know if there is a Virginia politician out there that quite loves the Virginia State Capitol building as much as Joshua Cole. And if you can, if you're in Richmond, and you can get him, uh, get him to give you a tour, I highly recommend it. Reverend Cole has a long history of working at the state capitol. He was a teenager in 2005 when he was appointed by then speaker, the Honorable William Howell, as a page for the Virginia House of Delegates. And in that same year, he was chosen as the governor's page for then governor and now Senator Mark Warner. In 2016, he returned to the General Assembly again as staff assistant to the clerk of the Virginia State Senate. And when Joshua lost the 2017 House of Delegates race by a mere 82 votes, that didn't let, he didn't let that stop him from returning to the General Assembly anyway, and this time serving as Chief of Staff for Delegate Kelly Converse Troyer. Joshua has long been a community leader here in Fredericksburg. He currently serves as Stafford County Public School Superintendent's Equality, Diversity, and Opportunity Committee. He also serves in the Greater Fredericksburg Area Interfaith Council. And as of this weekend, he is the newly elected president of the Stafford, Stafford County Chapter of the NAACP. I hope you will join me in welcoming my friend, Joshua Cole. just to share some scattered remarks with you on this great legacy. Um, if you would just indulge me for just a few moments, I want to tell a personal story. And in 2003, we had a church conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we are coming off of the airplane in Atlanta. We had a connecting flight in Atlanta. And we're getting off our plane as we're walking through the hallways. We're going to our connecting flight to get to DC. And they open up the doors to the plane and they push this lady out in the wheelchair. And my mom says, Josh, Josh, that's Miss Glenn's got kid. I was like, no, that's not Miss Glenn. She said, yeah, that's Miss Glenn's got kid. She said, go, go talk to her, go talk to her. So I went over there and I said, excuse me, Miss, are you Miss Coretta Scott King? Why, yes, I am, young man, and how are you? <laughs> and she extended her hand to me, and I shook the hand of greatness. And for me, as a young boy growing up in Stafford County Public Schools, it was always exciting to hear stories of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And imagine how I felt as five years old and six years old when I found out he was assassinated and I could never meet him. But in 2003, the fates would allow that I would shake the hand of the next greatest person closest to him, his own wife. And that, to me, gives me the encouragement and the ability to believe that I have a personal connection 
to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's vision and his dream. And I just wanted to let you know this morning that the dream is yet alive. Yes. We cannot sit here 51 years later from the I Have a Dream speech and pretend that the dream of Dr. King has been actualized. I would offer perhaps that the dream has merely been anesthetized. We have all sold out to the idea that because certain legislation was repealed or passed that the dream was actualized. We have all sold out to the idea that just because in 2008 that we made history and the first African American president of these United States was elected that the dream was actualized. But the reality is we have merely placed band-aid after band-aid after band-aid after band-aid on a wound that has never been. But history repeats itself. I remember in 2016, my mother lives in Nashville now, and um, we were watching the, we were sitting in the living room, I was sitting with my grandmother. My grandmother has the onset of dementia. And we were sitting watching the news, and Granny said, no, no, no. I said, what's the matter, Granny? She said, no, no, no. I said, what's the matter, Granny? She said, I, I, I'm confused, I don't understand. I said, what's the matter? She said, the stuff they're talking about on TV, they talked about when I was a young girl. The stuff they talked about on TV was the same thing they talked about when your mama was born. So history is now repeating itself. And what we are finding out is that the differences we see in each other every day, when they should be celebrated, embraced, and cultivated, are rejected, isolated, hated, and filled with jealousy. But I have hope this morning, because I believe that the dream is yet alive. Amen. Consider for every child or student who doesn't see color and differences, yet still readily befriends someone who's different than they are. Consider the politician or the employer who gives a chance to someone they interview or pass legislation for who's different than they are. This shows us hope that the dream is yet alive. Dr. King illumined our minds when he taught us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I want to say that again. He illumined our minds when he said a threat to justice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so we take a look at what we're seeing right now. The injustices all throughout the United States and in our world. We can see that the injustices are today when the government is shut down. Uh, countless men of color are shut down by police and by their brothers and the police are not trusted in some of our communities. We see injustices when the administration and the former, who those are seeking a better life, are trying to come into the United States, are treated some human, and children are separated from their parents. We can see injustices everywhere. Sex trafficking is a common underground practice on American soil. Hard-working Americans are just barely making ends meet. Citizens must struggle and fight for basic health care access, rationing their medications to see if they can make it to the next month. Our environment is jacked up and only we are to blame. And African Americans are seeking identity in a world that celebrates their culture but hates them as a people. White people are trying to say, I am on your side, but they're still looked at skeptically, even though they want to help us out. And hard-working Latinx citizens are viewed as illegals and are harassed. And Native Americans are considered out of place and their history is virtually erased. And monuments are built to represent oppression and the dark history of American slavery. And they're being protected all in the name of our history. So we know justice everywhere is threatened. But as Dr. King so eloquently said, here we are to cash in our check for justice. Justice should be served to all because the dream is yet a lot. I'm not certain that in my lifetime I may see his dream actualized, but I know that during my lifetime, and I would pray that while you are here with me, that we can continue to fight to make sure his dream is yet alive. That's the job that we have here as American citizens and those who believe in the dream of Dr. King. That we continue to fight. We may not see it actualized in our day, but we can continue to make sure that the dream survives. We have the ability and the propensity to make sure that the dream continues to have legs and arms in our communities. And we must continue to stand up whenever you're in school and you see someone bullying. You ought to stand up and stand up for that friend and say, no, we will not stand for this. When you see injustices anywhere in your neighbors, anywhere in your family, anywhere in your friends, you should stand up and say, no, we will not stand for this. When we stand up for what is right, when we speak out for what is right, we continue to make the dream yet 
Allah. There is, y'all know I'm a preacher, so I, I had to throw something in there. There is a theological term called phronema. It's an ancient Greek word, and ancient Eastern Christians uh, carried this view that phronema was that gut feeling, that mentality that you had that pulled you to do what was right. But phronema has a duality. It's also positive and negative. Uh, but the positive phronema says it encourages me to do what I know is right from the inside of me. That gut feeling that tells me I have to do something because it's right. As we continue to keep Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's dream alive, let us be filled with positive phonema to do what is right and just for the people. We may not agree with certain people, we may not agree with certain people's choices in their lives, but we can all stand and say discrimination should not be given to anybody. We can have positive phonema to say, I may not agree with you, but I'm gonna stand with you because as a human, you deserve certain rights. And so we have to build this inside of us to say, I'm going to have positive phronema to fight for you because you look just like me. Your shade may be lighter. Your shade may be darker. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we are all one of the same. There is not black. There is not white. There is not Latino. There is not Middle Eastern. There is one race, and that is the race of humanity. And we have to fight together to make sure that the team is one I want to leave you with this. Benediction from St. Benedict of Assisi, and I hope these words will stare within you and push you to continue to fight for this dream that we believe is yet alive. May God bless us with this comfort at easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands and comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that when we do what others say cannot be done, we can still do it. I appreciate you all. God bless you. And thank you so much. just like we used to do in church. Come on, we can do better than that. Give him another yeah. an yeah. an awesome encouragement for that awesome word for a man, a young man in prison soon to be put in place by God. Be grateful and to good for me. It is now time for the song that my sister said early this morning when she gave the welcome that she wasn't going to sing. It's time for that song now. Lift every voice and sing. The words can be found on the back of your programs. I believe this song warrants us to be able to stand on our feet right where you are. and be able to sing this song with the passion in which it was written. Yeah. 
closing, but we would be remiss if this extremely important part, the call to action, was not presented. So at this time, we're going to call on William Warren Williams, the treasurer of Fredericksburg branch of the NAACP, for the call to action. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I know we're kind of uh, closing and winding down, so I'll try to be very brief. Um, but before I get to my main task of recruiting new members to join us, I want to speak directly to our membership base first. So please, raise your hand. I don't remember hearing, but I know there is a table on the outside that is signing up people, prepared to sign you up if you're interested that you can sign up before you leave here today. At this time, we are now going to call on the president of this great branch of NAACP, Charlene Jackson Fields. Give her a thundering applause. <laughs> take this opportunity to say thank you for supporting the Fredericksburg branch, NAACP's annual Martin Luther King Prayer Breakfast. It is because of your support that the branch continues to achieve its mission to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to lim eliminate race-based discrimination. The branch closed calendar year 2018 with 39 new members and a number of accomplishments that because of time, I'm only going to tell, tell you about a few. The political action committee was very active and effective. They conducted voter registration drives, distributed important voting information, co-sponsored the Fredericksburg Area Candidates Forum held at the Centra Rappahannock Regional Library. Four branch members completed the Virginia Department of Elections Voter Registration Drive Certification Training. Slave Auction Block is a major subject in our community. The branch developed a position statement recommending the removal of the block. The statement was presented to the City Council. As a result, three branch members serve on a committee with the City to determine the slave an additional ongoing history presentation of the block. KKK flyers were distributed in our communities. The branch felt that it was very important to demonstrate that Fredericksburg will not serve as a parking lot for the distribution of this, set, of this type of material. Thus, on February 6th, a special meeting was open, was open to the community and conducted. A panel that included the Commonwealth Attorney of Fredericksburg, a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, officer with the Fredericksburg City Fire Department, the Fredericksburg City Chief of Police, a representative of the Fredericksburg Sheriff's Department, and the Virginia State Police Department spoke to an audience about their thoughts regarding the distribution of flyers in our community. This standing room only meeting was a true reflection of the community's desire to cooperate with authorities and further the spirit of love and brotherhood in Fredericksburg. Thank you again to all who have supported this event. This is another success story. A special thank you is extended to our keynote speaker, Joshua Paul. Please stand, Mark. Mark is responsible for <laughs> Thank you for that, Mark. Also, we have student volunteers 
from the University of Murray, Washington. Many of them are members of our branch. Stand up, students. Let's look at you. Thank you so much. Everybody, everybody who breathed this breakfast. <laughs> Thank you to the breakfast committee and to our sponsors. And to our sponsors. You saw them on the screen. Our sponsors are, and if I mispronounce the name, please forgive me. The, the University of Mary Washington, Pamela Bridgewater and Reverend Dr. Russell Upwood. Victor, Marcy, and Mario Catlett, and Melvina, and Marcel K. Attorney John Gerlet, Mayor Mary Catherine Greenlaw, Alpha Kappa Psi Fraternity Incorporated, <laughs> Kenneth Leckie and the Liberty Town Arts Workshop, Germana Community College Educational Foundation, Psi Upsilon Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Reverend Dr. Faye S. Gunn, Caitlin Durham Bennett, the Fredericksburg Democratic Committee, the Honorable Anthony Bailey and Pam Bailey, Reverend and Mrs. Lawrence A. Davies, Attorney Emmett Fleming, Jr., and Mrs. Mary Campbell Fleming, George and Brenda Ford, Beth Shalom.